Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to Rethink Culture, the podcast that shines the spotlight on leaders of businesses that people love to work for. My name is Andreas Constantino. I'm a micromanager turned servant leader who developed a passion for work-based culture. And I'm also the founder of Rethink Culture, a company that helps businesses create a healthier workplace culture by turning their culture into a KPI so that they can manage and measure. Today, I have the very much pleasure of welcoming Richard Sheridan, founder and CEO of Manly Innovations, a software company in Michigan, also known as a chief storyteller in his own company. He has written two books, Joy Inc. and Chief Joy Officer. And what's unusual about Manly Innovations is they have around about 3,000 visitors every year coming to the company just to witness the culture. And Richard also tells me he has many hobbies, skiing, golf, and a pilot's license, as well as being a father to three daughters, a grandfather to four granddaughters, and with one more grandchild on the way. And with all of that, Rich, very welcome to the Rethink Culture podcast. Thank you, Andreas. Great to be here. So where do we start? Um, tell us a little bit about Joey. Or actually, not before the book. Tell us a bit about Menlo Innovations and um, what led you to the journey of founding Menlo Innovations. Yeah, so Menlo was founded in 2001. Uh, it is my first sort of real entrepreneurial venture. I had a few other things I dabbled in when I was much younger, but uh, this was the for real one. Um, and... Uh, we founded the company with a crazy big mission. We wanted to end human suffering in the world as it relates to technology <laughs> by returning joy uh, to both technology and to the teams that design it and build it. So you were very uh, conscious about that mission when you started? Absolutely, yes. That was a mission statement we crafted in our earliest months of existence and later would come to describe it to many of those tour visitors who come and visit, that they have come to a place that has very intentionally created a culture focused on what we like to call the business value of joy. And uh, what were some of the early influences you had that maybe sparked that passion about creating joy? Were you dissatisfied? Were you disillusioned with, with life at work from your previous work per perhaps yeah you know i had this fantastic experience when i was young i touched a computer for the first time in 1971 when i was just a kid in high school uh, i was 13 years old um i know a lot of younger people these days are amazed that there were in fact computers back in 1971 they're a little different than they are today of course uh but um in those early days, I just fell in love with the idea of programming. It was one of these just uh, mind-blowing moments. Probably, I bet a lot of programmers can relate to that. The first time they had a computer do what they told it to do and it worked, they were like, oh my gosh, I did this. Uh, and it felt very artistic to me. It felt very creative. Um, I had a wonderful teacher who kind of really uh, unleashed a creative spirit inside of me. Uh, by the next year in high school, I'd written a gaming program to play fantasy baseball on the computer. I typed in all of the major league baseball players into the computer so my friends and I could play our favorite teams against one another in the cold Michigan winter months on the computer. And I entered that program into a programming contest and I won the uh, international gaming category for that program. And the people who were supplying this, the compute power, wanted to see the kid who won the contest because it was a pretty big feather in their cap, too. Uh, because doing computer science education in high school in the early 70s was a little bit unusual. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, the people who ran the computing center were the leader of that group, came to visit the kid who won the contest. And he asked me a fateful question. He said, do you want to come work for me? And I said, doing what? And he says, programming. I said, you can get paid for doing this? And uh, so I got my first job as a programmer before I could even drive a car. And uh, 
it was a wonderful several first several years of programming experience it was very heady time you know I, here i am this kid that's building email systems and other things for the school systems that we worked in i started having teams of people working around me we were just it was just that kind of energized creative atmosphere that all of us probably dream about in our careers and i had it i had it at a very young age uh, I realized, you know, I didn't have enough education in computer science to really go far. So I went to the University of Michigan, got a couple of degrees uh, in computer science and computer engineering and launched a career that, um, you know, I thought, boy, I, I've got the world by the tail. By the time I graduated from college, I had about seven years of programming experience. You know, I've got two degrees from a really big deal university in computer science, and it's an industry that's just about to take off, right? The PCs were just coming out and all this. Mm -hmm. I've got the world by the tail. It didn't take long before I fell into what I now call a deep trough of disillusionment about the industry, uh, where I started seeing big problems. And I thought they were, they were my fault. Right. I thought I was the one that was maybe I'm not qualified. Maybe I'm not as good at this as I thought I was because we were missing deadlines. We were blowing budgets. We were uh, working through the night. Uh, we were delivering crappy quality. The users were unhappy. We missed the mark on what the company wanted us to build. And the marketing and sales people are complaining. The customers are complaining. The people who worked for me were complaining. Everybody was unhappy. I, I would go home after very long nights. My wife would look at tired me and she'd say, you, you don't look happy. And I said, I'm not. And she said, what are you going to do about it? I said, I don't know. And I was scared. I mean, I, this was what I knew. This is what I'd gone to school for. This was what, putting a roof over our head. This is what was, you know, building a life for our young family at that time. And I thought, what, what am I going to do? And uh, I contemplated in those sort of my late 20s, early 30s, maybe I should just get out of the industry. Maybe I should find something else. And whatever uh, wiring is inside of me, part of it is optimism. Part of it was a belief that if there's this big a problem, there's probably some grand solution waiting to be found. And so I started reading a lot of books, but not books on technology. I've started reading books on teamwork and management and design thinking and um, leadership. Uh, and what I realized in reading those books was the challenge I faced and the challenge that most people in our industry still face to this day is not a technological challenge. It's a challenge of how do we organize the humans more effectively. And that became my passionate pursuit. I started consuming books on these topics I didn't know what I was looking for exactly. I'd had that youthful experience that really sort of set my brain for, I know what's possible. I wanted to get back to that. Um, but I also know my wiring well enough that when I'm in search mode like that, I will know it when I see it. And uh, that started to happen much later in my career and would ultimately lead to the creation of Menlo Innovations. Realized you, you, you wanted to build a better workplace for software development. Was that in your twenties? Yeah. You know, I had this dream as a, as a student at Michigan, you know, when I was in my early twenties, I, I just had this picture in my head of what do I want my work life to look like? And I thought to myself back then, just dream in my brain, um, a big open and collaborative work environment, a place filled with human energy, a lot of collaboration, doing interesting, new, innovative things together, accomplishing big goals, not as individuals, but as a team, because that's a bit of what I experienced when I was that kid is still in high school. And I thought I can do that again. Uh, and yet, my career looked the exact opposite. We were all isolated in little cubes and offices, and we were, uh, you know, failing to understand what customers actually need. And we were shipping products before they were ready. And uh, we didn't have any processes for quality that were worth anything at all. Um, 
we did a terrible job recruiting and uh, in hiring and onboarding and all, everything was organized, <laughs> misorganized. Everything was poorly organized. And, and I just thought, no, there, there has to be a better way. It just has to be. And I was determined to find it. So where did you start? So you, you started Menlo Innovations in 2001, I think. Yes. And yep. what were the first foundation pillars? of joy. Yeah, to, to understand Menlo, you have to understand what happened just before Menlo. Uh, because there was this long pursuit. Um, and then I was handed an opportunity to pers to really have as much control as a human can have of the things that were important. Uh, this was back when I was a, a director at a company called Interface Systems here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and my boss, Bob Nero, had been sort of guiding me towards an executive position with the company. And one day he brought me into his office and said, Rich, I want to promote you to VP. And I said, no, not interested. I am not interested in the uncapped personal commitment that will be required to be an executive inside of a troubled public company. Oh, he didn't want to hear that. He was very upset with me. Um, and uh, so I left his office that day upset. He was upset. Uh, I went home that night and I contemplated what just happened that afternoon when I told my boss, no, I don't want the promotion. You know, because there was a lot of, <laughs> I, I remember him telling me at the time, he says, Rich, you have, you have three daughters your life is about to get very expensive. I'm going to help with that. We're going to get you into this executive position. It was an interesting ploy on his part, but uh, there was something far more important than money to me uh, at, at, at risk there. And it was in here. Um, and so I went home that night and I thought about the, my experience as a youth, my dream as a college student, the disillusionment I'd gone through over the last 15 years. And I realized I had just been handed a grand opportunity to make the dream real. So I went to back to Bob Nero, my CEO, uh, the next day. And I said, I will take the job on one condition. I need your help. He was intrigued. And he said, what? I said, I need your help because I want to build the best damn software team this town has ever seen. And he asked me, he says, Rich, what happened? He says, 12 hours ago, you were telling me no, and now you come back with this? And I said, you know, Bob, I've had this dream for a long time. This is my opportunity. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but I'm going to pour everything I can into taking this opportunity and turning it into what I want. And within two years, we started to reformulate how interface systems work. Not just my team, but the effect on my team started to affect the whole company. Um, by 1999, uh, I had met a guy, James Goble, who would be a consultant to me then, now my co-founder at Menlo. I'd read a book by a gentleman named Kent Beck, who wrote something called Extreme Programming Explained that a lot of people in the programming industry know well. Um, and I saw a video on an industrial design firm in California called IDEO. Uh, they had featured them redesigning. What does design look like? Because I was confused about design. I thought design came from genius designers, but design is really in the minds of the people you intend to serve. And our job as designers is to pull out what they know and build it into whatever it is we're designing. And so those those things all happened within a short period of time, reading the book, meeting James, seeing the IDEO video and having this platform from which I could, and we made dramatic changes quickly. Within six months, we had absolutely transformed interface systems into something that looks a lot like Menlo does today. And we, we were running it. it within six months. It was working. I was back to this word joy. I, I wouldn't have used the word back then, but I could feel it. I could, I was walking in every day excited. I, I loved what we were doing. I loved what we were accomplishing. And then in 2001, we had been acquired based on the work that my team had done in transforming the culture of that company. And then the internet bubble burst. 
and all this wonderful work that we had done over the previous two years was literally washed away in an instant. And I went home and I told my wife I'd lost my job. And she looked at me with tears in her eyes and she said, you're unemployed? And I said, no, honey, I'm an entrepreneur now. <laughs> and uh, she didn't exactly know what that meant. Uh, but I realized that while I lost everything when the internet bubble burst, you know, the job, the title, the paycheck, the options, the everything, <clears throat> they couldn't take away what I had learned in those two years. And what I had learned would eventually become the basis for Menlo. And we started Menlo right on the heels of the dot-com bubble burst and uh, very quickly came up with a famous mission statement that we wanted to end human suffering in the world uh, as it relates to technology, not only for the people who are paying for it and the people who ultimately use it, but for the people who are building it. And the word we chose to center our culture on was an unusual word in the context of work. We picked the word joy. We wanted to return joy to technology. And that became the rest of the story, as they say. And now I know why you're called the chief storyteller, because you are really good with stories. So, Rich, um, when you transformed the company back at the interface days, using uh, extreme programming and other principles. Was there any resistance to oh gosh, the change? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, when I first read Kent Beck's book, um, and it wasn't even a book back then. He, he, he hadn't, the book came out just a little bit later, but there were wiki pages and all this sort of thing. So I was learning about these principles of extreme programming, and I was intrigued by a lot of them automated unit testing frameworks, test-driven design, uh, iterative development, short cycles, you know, the story carding process, all that kind of stuff. But there was this one thing inside of Kent's, uh, you know, 14 principles of extreme programming that at first my brain resisted. And it was this idea of paired programming. And I kind of looked at that at first, I'm like, huh? Why? Why would I put two programmers on one keyboard and mouse? That doesn't make sense. I'd be cutting productivity in half. And then I started to realize personally what the benefits of that could be. And, and actually, somewhat like Kent did when he came up with it, I looked back in my own programming career and realized how much better the code was when I had pulled someone up next to me and said, hey, Frank, come here, sit down with me. This code has to work the first time. Can you just work with me? And we sat together. So I had experienced it. I just never gave it a name and I never thought it should be an instantiated practice that you do all the time. But, but it started to intrigue me. So then I brought this, these ideas to my team. And at the time I had about 14 developers. Um, I was still the new kid on the block at Interface Systems. I had only been there 16 years at that point. <laughs> and you were some the new kid. After this. Yeah. yeah. Some of my programmers had been there for 30 years. Okay, so this was a this was a seasoned team, you know, and I'm still the new kid on the block at 16 years of crazy new ideas. So I brought them together. I'm the VP now, so I can, you know, I can kind of tell them what to do if I want to. Uh, but I knew that if I was going to make big changes, I had to get them to join me. And so I presented these ideas on Kent Beck to them. And uh, I asked them what they thought. And at first, all of them just looked down at the floor. <laughs> they, they, they didn't even want to make eye contact. They didn't say anything. And I said, guys, I'm really thinking of going in this direction. What do you think? Finally, one of my developers raises his hand. I said, Gil, tell me what you think. He said, Rich, blood, mayhem, murder. That's what I think. <laughs> he says, do not pull me out of my office and put me out in a big open room. Do not make me share a computer with another human being. And for goodness sakes, do not make me share my code. It's my code. So that was the first reaction, blood, mayhem, murder. Wow. Um, now, after that meeting, two of my guys came up to me, didn't want to speak up at the meeting because they could feel the resistance from mm -hmm. everybody else. And they said, we want to try it. 
we want to run the experiment. So I authorized a little three week experiment where Bob and Claire paired together and did all the practice of extreme programming for three weeks just to see what it would be like. And, um, Claire stopped me about two weeks into the experiment out in the parking lot. We we're walking in the building and, um, He's, he, he asked me a really funny question. He said, Rich, are you still going to pay me to work here? And I said, what do you mean? He said, I got to tell you, this new way of working feels like so much fun. It doesn't feel like work anymore. I'm not sure you should pay me. So this was the reactions I was getting at the beginning. Blood mayhem murder at one end of the spectrum. I will work for you for free at the other end of the spectrum. I was not getting lukewarm responses. And, um, and so we went through a series of ongoing experiments to uh, continue to uh, try this and um, and eventually magic happened. Um, so zooming to Manilow Innovations today, when a visitor comes in, what's typically the one or two things that create a wow moment for them? Yeah, I, what's fun for me, uh, and I get to do this a lot, is often I will meet the visitors before they actually walk in our door. And so I'll walk in with them. The door opens, they walk into our space, and I listen. And it happens almost every single time. It's, it's amazing. It's, it happens so often, I can just predict it. The first word out of their mouth when they walk in is, And because they can feel the human energy in the space, uh, you know, and uh, again, we're, we're <laughs> these days, we are really counterculture. You know, we were counterculture up to the pandemic. And then, of course, we, like everyone else, had to all go home and work from home and all that sort of thing for about 18 months. Now we're all back in the office five days a week. Um, and so people are shocked by that. They're like, really? Like the whole world's going work for a moment. You guys are all back in the office. You know, how do you do that? Why do you do that? Why, you know, is there resistance to that? And, uh, but, you know, when they come in and they, they walk into this big open room and they find out that my office is a table out in the room with everybody else. There is no corner office for the CEO or for my co-founder, James. And they can just feel the energy, the camaraderie, the, the laughter, the, the dogs running around, sometimes the baby in the place and that sort of thing. Um, the, now they're intrigued. They're like, okay, tell me what's going on here. Why do you, you know, wh wh what's happening over here? What are these visual artifacts about? And so, uh, but the first thing they notice when I, you know, I, I usually have to point it out to them, but when they finally see it for what it is, I say, yeah, look how we work. Two people, one computer. Mm. one keyboard and mouse and they're like what? so <laughs> so let's say one of your uh visitors is an entrepreneur and they say rich i really love what you've done here tell me what is the one or two things i can take back at my business and create more joyful work well number one uh I, what i tell people is um, and it is the culture equation piece is you have to be intentional about your culture. And so you have to pick your culture's intention. And for us, it's joy. Um, and for us, it's the outcomes of that joy. We, we want to delight the people we intend to serve. That's our belief about the purpose of an organization is an organization's purpose should be embedded in service to others. It should be embedded in serving others with joy and delight to, to produce delight in the people you serve that, that your work is so embraced and loved by the people you intend to serve that they come back to you and say, thank you. I love what you did for us. So, so at the very least, that's the basic intention. Mm -hmm. driven through our purpose and supported by our culture. And then, of course, you know, it's it's easy to say that, be intentional about your culture. And I'm guessing a lot of people say, yeah, I think we're intentional about our culture. And then I would ask them, show me the evidence. And I will tell you where we look first is 
show me your HR practices. And how do your HR practices align with your cultural intention? How do you recruit? How do you interview? How do you select? How do you onboard? How do you give feedback? How do you promote? What decisions lead to making a decision perhaps to fire someone? How do you handle that conversation? All of those things that are traditional in every organization. Every organization has to work through those things in one way or another. What evidence do you see in those practices in your company that align with your cultural intentions? And so uh, you might imagine ours look very different than uh, many organizations. So how do you hire and how do you onboard? These were the two kind of parts in the book, Joy Inc., that really stood out for me. I found them very refreshing. So tell us more. Yeah. Uh, so um, part of this is remembering how we work. And so uh, let me describe how we work in a short sentence and then mm -hmm. back it up into the interview process. So I described that we work in pairs, two people, one computer, sharing a keyboard and a mouse, collaborating all day long. This isn't like, come help me with my work. This is our work done together. And it's done all day long, every day. Okay, so that's the typical work day for someone who works at Menlo every single day is you have a pair partner with you. You're sharing a keyboard. It's not come over on my computer. This is our shared computer, our shared work together. And then we switch those pairs at least every five business days. So it's very explicit. This isn't like, oh, I really like Andreas. You know, you come over here and work with me. No, we're going to get you to work with everybody on the team. Okay, we want, we believe there's a lot of benefit to that, and we can talk about why we believe that. Um, so now, how would you find people who want to work like that if they've never worked like that before? Because most people do not work like that. It's a very unusual work environment. So we reinvented the interview practice. We bring people in in groups. We call it an extreme interview. Now, that's not because it's intense or something. It's, it's named after extreme programming. Mm -hmm. and, um, and obviously, there's this element of extreme programming that is pairing. And so we call it an extreme interview. We'll bring in 30 to 40 people at a time. And we pair them during the interview with another candidate. Not pair them with a Menlonian. We pair off the candidates one with another. And then we give them the weirdest instructions you will ever get in a job interview. You know, Andreas, if you're paired with, you know, Susan, mm -hmm. uh, we say your job in this interview through the practice you're going to do for the next 20 minutes is to help her get a second interview. Help your pair partner succeed. What we're going to evaluate you on is how do you support another human being? Why would that be important to us? Because that's the way we work every single day. So we are communicating, intentionally communicating our deepest held cultural value from the moment of first contact. Now, a lot of people think we are hiring for culture fit. And I used to believe that. I no longer believe that because the variety of people we get here, there's no way this is a culture fit test. What it is, and this is what I've discovered over time is we are teaching our culture from the moment of first contact. We are sharing with you what are our what are our expectations for you if you're to come to work here. And if we can share those expectations clearly, succinctly and logically and, and you know, not complicated. Um, it's amazing how human beings can adapt if they're presented with simple, reasonable expectations. And so we pair you for 20 minutes and then we switch the pairs. So now you're not paired with Susan, you're paired with Bill, and then you're paired with John. And three pairings and we send you all home. It lasts about two hours. We don't ask you any questions during this interview. We are simply observing your behavior. We actually tell you before we begin this, what failure looks like. We tell people, we're not trying to weed you out. We're trying to weed you in. We want you to succeed. This isn't a, uh, let's see who we can weed out as quickly as possible. It's like, let's see who can adapt the fastest to this crazy new environment that we have. 
And if you don't work out that time, because we'll we'll vote right after you leave as to who would bring in for a second interview. And that's the only um, bar we're trying to set in this very first mm-hmm. interview is who do we invite back in for a second interview? And the people who come in on a second interview come in for a full day. We pay them. They pair in the morning with one Memlonian. They pair in the afternoon with another. And they do real work on a real client project. And then at the end of that day, we look for three more votes. The two people you paired with and you. Because you may say, this is really cool. I think this this is amazing. It's not for me. Okay, that's great. There's lots of other companies you can work for. Uh, but uh, we want to give you the experience. Because I think a lot of times interview processes feel very one-sided. Oh, wouldn't you be lucky to work for us if we choose you? You know, it's like, right. really? I don't know if that's true. <laughs> you know, I should give you an opportunity to see what does it feel like? What does it actually feel like to work here? And if that day works, and we all say thumbs up again, then you come in for a paid three-week trial if it works for your life, if you can get enough time up. But what we're really trying to say is, look, this is different, and we better give you the best possible opportunity and us to figure out is this going to work between us can you adapt quick enough to our expectations of supporting other people of of not trying to take strong ownership and say i did this and all that kind of stuff it's just a different kind of environment so we want to give you the best possible chance for success to the critics that say this might work for a software company but it won't work for my company what do you say you know, I, I, you might guess that I've spent a lot of time looking at other industries and saying, who else pairs people? Oh, my goodness. It's, there's so many. It's, it's so obvious to us uh, as humans that uh, we just take it for granted. Uh, for example, uh, when's, the, when's the last time you got on a commercial airliner and felt comfortable when the pilot said, oh, my co-pilot called in sick today. I got this. I'm going to do it all by myself. <laughs> you know? It's like, so pilots? Uh, uh, emergency, you know, police mm-hmm. and firefighters and paramedics, uh, healthcare professionals, often a surgeon and a parasurgeon, a nurse and a pair nurse, an anesthesiologist and a pair anesthesiologist. What I like to say is when there's lives at risk, and there is with software now, um, we pair people. Uh, parents of teenagers. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I realize some people have raised teenagers without a spouse. So that that works, but uh, I'm guessing there are moments uh, in every parent's life that, boy, I really need a pair partner right now uh, to make sure my kids stay safe. Um, so, uh, golfers and caddies, you know, is is a great example of of pairing as well. And so, there's lots of examples, um, and uh, we don't just pair our programmers. Pretty much everybody in the company pairs. And so uh, we've just found such great benefits from pairing uh, in terms of um, <clears throat> speed to a quality solution, uh, uh, you know, onboarding and, and growing people and transferring skills and making sure we don't have these towers of knowledge that mm-hmm, define mm-hmm, most software mm-hmm. teams. All those kind of things are just tremendous side benefits we get from pairing. What were the some of the mistakes or... Um experiments or failed experiments that you made on the way? Yeah, I mean, there's so many uh, along the way because we just keep trying stuff and we never get too uh, wound up about, you know, what didn't work and why did we try that? Uh, But, you know, in the early days, um, we weren't, um, we kind of let everybody sort of self-select their pairs. Mm-hmm. You just oh, you just figure out who you want to pair with, and and we found out right away. Of course, it was it was like those difficult youthful experiments on the playground when uh, you know you were you were playing some sport and you had to pick your teams, and then there was always the kid left at the end. <laughs> it felt like oh, nobody wants me on their team, and uh, so uh, you know we just started assigning the pairs. And uh, we thought, oh, that, we'll just do that for a while, and then everybody will get used to pairing with everybody else, and then we won't have to do it anymore. And the team actually came to us and said, don't ever stop assigning the pairs. That removes so much social anxiety. And quite frankly, there's people I probably wouldn't have naturally paired with on my own, but because we're forcing that equation, they find out, oh, they're not as bad as I thought they were going to be, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's lots of stuff we're always trying. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. Are you intentional? 
one of our famous phrases here is let's run the experiment. So what you see here is um, uh, we like to take action versus take a meeting. If somebody has an idea, mm -hmm. we're like, well, let's try it and see if it works. Um, and if it does, great, keep going. If it doesn't, either adjust it or, or forget it. Are you intentional about hiring for diverse, you know, um, ethnic origin or anything else, or you just let it grow organically? What's, what's wonderful about our interviewing process is it scales so easily. And the reason I bring that up in the context of this question is, I think the, the mistakes I used to make as a hiring manager go right to the heart of where I think diversity and inclusion starts to break down. If I looked at a resume when I was an executive, you know, if, if I was hiring for a position, I, I know I would look and say, oh, look, they went to the University of Michigan, just like mm -hmm. me. Oh, they took the same classes from the same professors that I did. Oh, you know, I can I can see their grade point average is, is a lot like mine. Or they grew up around where I did. They must be a lot like me. And I was I did really well. You know, shouldn't I hire them? And you're going to end up with very mm -hmm. low diversity in that mm -hmm. situation. Um, here, we don't even look at the people who are. So when we're pairing during that extreme interview I told you about where you put one candidate mm -hmm. with another. There's a Munlonian sitting on the other side just taking notes about what they see. The people taking notes do not have access to the resumes of the people sitting across mm. from them. So they're just looking at the humans. And I think the first step towards diversity is don't look at eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. Look at the human beings. And when the, when the judgment of second interview is, did you make your peer partner look good? Did you support another human being? The cognitive diversity that results from this is very high. Because this is where I started to realize, because a lot of people said, oh, you're hiring for culture fit. You must have all the extroverted programmers on planet Earth working for you. <laughs> because who else would like to work in an environment like this but extroverts? And then I kept looking, I'm like, almost none of us are extroverts mm -hmm. here. I mean, the, the level of deep introversion here at Menlo is very high because that's the industry we're in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one of the things I discovered about extrovert versus introvert, it's not that introverts don't uh, like to work with other humans. They just prefer fewer, safer, deeper relationships, mm -hmm, and they mm -hmm. get that here. And so um, I started looking at the people we're collecting, and they're also different different backgrounds, different amount of education, different kinds of experience. Uh, and, and one of the moments for me uh, that uh, was kind of mind-blowing actually was um, there was a gentleman that he's still here, Scott. Um, and, um, you know, people were asking us about our interview and Scott has an interesting, I actually tell Scott's story and I think it's Chief Joy Officer about his interview process because it was kind of laborious. He tried it a couple of times. We gave him some extra chances, that sort of thing. And eventually he got in, uh, but he didn't, he didn't align at first. And then he had learned to adapt and that adaptation has made him into just a terrific leader here. But, uh, you know, people were asking me questions like you're asking me. And I said, hey, let's go talk to Scott about his experiences coming here. So we worked through all the things that Scott went through to eventually make it through our interview process. And then I, uh, I asked Scott, I said, well, what was it that drew you to Menlo? Because clearly you weren't, you know, you weren't succeeding in our interview process, but you kept trying, you kept wanting to be here. I said, what was it about it that, about us that want, had you want to be here? And he smiled, he says, you guys don't look at resumes. And I'm like, oh tell me more, you know, like, what did I just learn? You know, what did your resume say? And he said, well, if you'd looked at my resume, you would have seen that uh, the only education I had, formal education, is I, I got a welding certificate. He says, no formal education in computer science. He says, that was a hobby. He says, most people wouldn't hire me. You guys would. He says, Amazing. that intrigued me. And so I think we end up getting a tremendous diversity here that is the truest kind of diversity, which is the cognitive diversity you need for creativity. So I'm hearing you are 
you're hiding everything that can introduce inadvertent bias into the hiring mm-hmm. process. Well, you you can't hide what people look like. You can't hide the color of their skin or right. You can probably tell I look a little older than yeah. others. Yeah. Um but uh but I also think the other the other thing we do is the team builds the team. And what's interesting about that is when we get together after that extreme interview, it's a big session. You know, if there were 40 people that came in the interview, there's 20 of us together talking through what we saw. If you had somebody who was like, oh, I don't really like people like that, <laughs> exposing that in front of 20 of your peers would be, be a big risk, right? And so what do you do? You end up talking about the behaviors you saw. You end up talking about the, mm-hmm. you know, what you mm-hmm. saw happen. It's really hard to bias yourself. And, and you know, and people will challenge. They'll say, you know, yeah, okay, they, they struggled. You think they were nervous. I was nervous when I went through that. Do you think that they might have been nervous? Or we'll look at it and say, okay, they didn't do well in the first pairing. Did they get better at pairing two? Did they get better at pairing three? Were they already showing signs of adaptation? And that becomes the nature of the conversation as opposed to, well, where did they get their degree from or or that Mm -hmm, sort of thing. mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, we're humans. We're going to have normal biases about things. Mm -hmm. Um, But, um, but I think, you know, from, from my own experience, I know this is so different from anything I used to do and, um, and so much better in terms of the resulting team. And I don't know if, modern software companies are any more thoughtful about culture than they were 10 and 20 years ago. I haven't seen that. I just, uh, you know, the stacks, the technology stacks and the computers and the tools evolve, but culture hasn't maybe by, you know, we don't have enough role models uh, that are spreading the word. You know, and I think, you know, for me, that's one of the reasons that motivated me to write the book and motivates us to open our doors for tours. I mean, we could just keep everything a secret and Mm -hmm. not tell anybody about what we're doing uh, and keep it all to ourselves. But when we say we want to end human suffering in the world as it relates to technology, we can't do it by ourselves. So while we don't ever believe and would never say to anyone, we have found the one true way of working, Mm -hmm. We are a living, breathing example that people can come in and inspect and look at and ask questions about and then decide for themselves, do they see something here that they can bring back to their environment? And um, so there's lots of opportunities. That's why people come here, because if they were like me, you know, I didn't have a Menlo to go look at when I was on my search journey, so it took a long time. But I think every once in a while, when somebody's reading a book about anything and gets an inspirational thought in their head, they think to themselves, man, wouldn't it be cool if there was an example I could go visit right exactly. now? And uh, that's what we've become for a lot of people. What keeps you passionate and what still drives you to be at the helm of Menlo Innovations after 23 or so years 23 years yeah you know um i have achieved something that many don't ever get to achieve i got to the place i wanted to be and i know that's a blessing i know that is rare um and i am very grateful for where i've ended up in my life in my work life and the translation of being uh, happier at work and what that makes me as a father, as a husband, as a grandfather uh, in the world. And so I will tell you, when I walk into Menlo every day and feel that energy that causes our visitors to say, wow, there's a wow that happens inside of me every single day. I sit right out in the room with the team I literally have right next to me, I mean, literally our tables are right next to one another, two programmers working on one of our big projects, sitting right next to me. I get to hear their, overhear their interactions. Um, uh, You know, to me, it's just, it's joy. 
I, I don't know if there are any other, other There's ways. There's no other it. words. Yeah. Rich, where can people find more about Menlo Innovations? Yeah, obviously our website, and we have free public tours, virtual tours, once a month or twice a month, I think. Um, so you can just you know click on a link and sign up for a free virtual tour of now the real Menlo. We, we started doing virtual tours in the pandemic, uh, and then we realized, why would we stop doing that? <laughs> we learned how to virtualize right. our tours. Right. Uh, so you can do... Back then, it was virtual tours of the virtual Menlo. Now it's virtual tours of the real Menlo. Obviously, if you're anywhere near Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, and willing to, you know, if it takes getting on an airplane, a lot of people still do this. Uh, we also have uh, tours that you can come to in person. Um, and so I would encourage that, you know, just the free public tours here, wherever you are, you know, Andreas, you're in Athens, Greece. You can just click on a link and you're here, click on a link in your home. You might have to deal with some time zone differences, mm -hmm. but that's about it. Uh, so we get people from all over the world. And since we started doing virtual tours, uh, we've had visitors from 77 countries and 47 U.S. states. Um, so it's been really successful in that regard. Uh, obviously, the books are there, Joy Inc. and Chief Joy Officer, to really learn the drippy details of the history and the thinking and the philosophies and that sort of thing. Um, if you want to, you know, anybody in your podcast can connect with me on LinkedIn uh, and follow me there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to expand my network by saying yes to your invitations. I would recommend to your audience that they say something like, hey, I just saw the Rethink Culture podcast with Andreas and I really love to connect with you. That's more likely than the, <laughs> than the blind in, right. uh, you know, ones that has say nothing. Um, but uh, yeah, so lots of ways to connect and, and get to know us. And Rich, if you were to whisper to about their workplace culture, uh, what would you tell them? What would they have to rethink? Um, you know, I would say um, look inside first. For me, this journey was a journey of self-discovery. You know, I had those youthful experiences. I had a dream. And then I got onto reality of building a life, buying a home, having a family, all the responsibilities of life. And work just became work. And it became a, a drudgery. And it became tiring. And it became... Um, uninspiring and uh, de-energizing and all that sort of thing. And I think, you know, as, as the, uh, the famous quote is, you know, and, uh, you know, most people lead lives of quiet desperation and go to their graves with their heart still their the song in their heart left unsung. I got to sing the song that was in my heart. Look inside first. No journey like I'm on can begin unless it is first a journey of self-discovery. And uh, I had to learn what I really wanted from work, what I really wanted. And then I could begin to have ask others to join me. Rich, I could think no better way to end the, uh, the podcast than with these words. Um, you're incredibly inspiring to me and I hope to many more. Uh, Thank you. The virtue of pursuing one's true calling. And our true calling should be to make meaning of our lives, including our work lives, pursuing what we love, what gives us energy, and especially uh, what gives energy to the people around us. And so with that, I'd like to, uh, to thank you again, to thank everyone who stayed until the end to this episode. Thank you for being generous for your time, Rich, and thank you for the audience for being generous with your time. Uh, if you like the show, you can support us by telling your friends. You can leave a comment in your podcast app. You can email me personally at andreas at rethinkculture.co. And you can also watch this episode if you just listen to it. You can go to YouTube and go to the channel at Rethink Culture, at sign Rethink Culture, and just uh, watch. And as I like to say, keep on leading and creating... Uh, intentional, happier workplace cultures for you and those around you.